Okay, we'll get started here. And once again, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce you again to the president of Naval War College, Rear Admiral Shoshana Chapfield. Oh, please hold your applause for our next guest. Dear attendees, I am honored to introduce our 32nd Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Gilday. <laughs> Sir, we have a wonderful audience for you one. of students and uh, our CNO, Distinguished International Fellows, our faculty members and deans. Uh, thank you, sir, for joining us. Yeah, it's an honor to join you. Thank you for the invitation. We have about 30 minutes together, and so I'll be uh, brief uh, in my comments. I really want to talk about allies and partners and the accelerated path that we're on with sharing uh, innovative technologies. But before I do that, uh, I'd like to thank Admiral Chatfield for her service uh, as a president over the past four years. She's done an outstanding job, and uh, I am very pleased that she is moving on to Brussels as a U.S. mill rep to the NATO military committee, and I know that she'll be spectacular in that role as well uh, and serve uh, not, only, uh, not only our Navy, but our nation very well in that position. I'd also like to uh, thank the uh, Distinguished International Fellows, Admiral Saunas, Admiral Barrera, and Admiral Verma uh, for their continued good work uh, and integration up at the up at the War College. Uh, and the personal relationship I've had with them over the past uh, four years has been uh, very magnificent. So, gentlemen, thank you. Um, I'd also like to congratulate Mr. Daniel Holland uh, for his role uh, as the Chairman of the Board of Trustees and the Executive Committee of the Naval War College Foundation. Thank you, sir, for service as well. Uh, so um, let's take it all lines and get the ship underway for a few minutes and talk about, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I thought that uh, in thinking about the theme of your conference, which is preserving America's leadership role, um, I thought that, uh, you know, what one of the things that um, I think is foundational to America's standing in the world uh, is our relationship with our partners, uh, and in our, our case, uh, with our fellow navies, uh, and all the good work we're doing together every day around the globe. Uh, but where I wanted to talk about uh, for a few minutes is the latest trend that I've seen over the past uh, number of years with respect to our sharing uh, technology at a pace, uh, at a scope and scale uh, that we haven't witnessed before. Um, I say that because um, it's not it, it's it's much more of an integrated approach uh, to getting after key operational problems that are common uh, to many of us. Um, and instead of uh, the United States Navy uh, developing a capability and then uh, and then sharing that with others, we are also leveraging many of the high tech companies uh, across the world in many different countries. Uh, particularly in the areas of unmanned and AI um, that are providing us with capability, uh, with, with operational insights uh, that we did not have, uh, at least from companies here in the U.S. And so I think that um, that sharing back and forth is gaining momentum. Um, I think that AUKUS, uh, the AUKUS uh, agreement uh, among the U.S., Australia, and the U.K. is a good example of that. Uh, when people think about AUKUS, most think about uh, submarine technology, but um, there's a second pillar of AUKUS that uh, is allowing us to share technology in the areas of uh, quantum computing, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, unmanned, uh, machine learning uh, at a scale that we have not before. Barriers have been knocked down with respect to information sharing uh, and the sharing of technical data that's allowed us to progress very rapidly uh, in terms of sharing those kinds of groundbreaking technologies quickly. We're doing the same with other countries on a bilateral basis. Uh, and so there are spin-offs um, uh, to some of the work being done at AUKUS uh, 
uh, that we're also benefiting uh, our allies and partners, and they are benefiting benefiting us. So it's been uh, mutually beneficial. I know that most of the audience uh, is familiar with the work that we've done with Unmanned in the Middle East. Uh, and I think a highlight of that effort uh, has been the fact that we've done that with uh, and through allies and partners. That has not been a singular U.S. effort by any stretch. Uh, not to mention the fact that um, among these six partners are all the companies and the technologies that those companies have brought to bear uh, in the areas of unmanned and AI and machine learning. Um, as some of you know, we are now uh, scaling that effort to South America, beginning with uh, the world's lar uh, the world's uh, longstanding uh, UNITAS exercise next month. Um, it's our it's our uh, oldest uh, uh, longstanding multilateral exercise that will leverage to introduce those unmanned technologies and concepts that we've refined in the Middle East. And now we're going to move them uh, to Southern Command to get after real operational problems that are common uh, to many of the countries and navies uh, in, in the uh, AOR. Uh, so that would include um, illicit uh, trafficking. It would also include uh, illegal uh, and unregulated fishing. And so our idea is to provide an unblinking eye over that activity in order to see it, detect it, um, and then to uh, take the data that we uh, gather with unmanned platforms and together with human and SIGINT and other intelligence sources, give us a more predictable uh, understanding of how that illegal activity, uh, what the sources of it are, uh, how it flows through the theater, so that we can be much more predictive and effective in terms of uh, countering it. There are other applications of, of uh, uh, cutting technologies that we're applying. Uh, particularly in the areas like undersea and space that we are also sharing with uh, our allies and they're sharing with us across uh, across the world. Um, I'd also uh, probably wrap up by talking about just some of the uh, examples of high-end technologies. Aegis uh, would be an example. We now have at least a half a dozen countries around the world that use uh, Aegis technology in their ships. Standard missiles, uh, Tomahawk missiles. So these are high-end missiles that we've broken barriers with respect to uh, trading that kind of technology, that kind of high-end technology with other countries, finding a way to get to yes uh, instead of no. And so I think that um, uh, we've always valued our relationships, our close relationships with allies and partners. But I think in today's day and age where companies and not governments are leading the way with respect to cutting edge R&D, that our navies are really taking advantage of it. Uh, and I think in a collaborative way to get after problems uh, that we can't solve very easily using techniques and procedures and platforms uh, of the previous century. So setting the table with, uh, with innovation uh, and uh, uh, relationships uh, among other navies uh, that are now in some respects uh, leveraging those technologies. I'd like to open it up for any questions you might have um, about that kind of effort or any other uh, uh, aspects of, of the seminar that you have addressed in, in, the past, uh, uh, in the past few hours or earlier this week. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And questions for the audience? Steve Frary, a member of the foundation. I'm curious about your uh, focus on uh, sharing technology uh, with our partners and how that relates to our relationship with China and uh, sharing economic and uh, other technology and how that uh, fix, fits into our strategy. Well, I think first and foremost, um, it's uh, the sharing of the technology is based on a common vision that we share among allies and partners 
and that is to ensure that we sustain uh, for the free and open uh, use of the maritime commons under, on, and above the sea. And that's grounded upon uh, prosperity, uh, global prosperity. So, you know, as we've seen since um, um, since the rules-based international order was really set by Bretton Woods in 1944, uh, that those international norms have been a tide that's raised all boats. And so um, I think that's foundational uh, to sharing, sharing technologies that allow us to continue to ensure that the maritime commons remain free and open. That's first and, and, and fundamental. And I think that anybody that subscribes or rule, to the rules-based international order as it exists now and has existed for the past 70 years is a welcome partner in terms of, uh, in terms of not only operating together, but potentially sharing those kinds of technologies. I, I think that um, uh, if, I, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, uh, I hope um, it's really grounded upon a common vision. Good morning, CNO. Frank Pandolf here. Uh, you speak about readiness as your number one priority. How are we innovating in the world of training or applying new technologies to enhance readiness? Yeah, thanks, sir. Um, so there, there are two ways, I think, uh, that we really put our shoulder against. The first is ready, relevant learning, uh, which is uh, expanding training for our sailors well beyond the brick and mortar classrooms uh, to the virtual in a way that is uh, much more effective than we've done in the past and allow them to train at a rate and a frequency uh, where they're refreshed um, at a much faster pace than we've done um, than we've done previously, where we've sent we've sent sailors to school between duty stations. Now we can keep them refreshed at a relatively lower cost, but much more effectively uh, while they're in their while they're in their current demands. Uh, the second thing that we're leveraging is live virtual constructive training. So uh, LVC, uh, uh, much of it is based on technology from the gaming community, is allowing us uh, to train as fleets rather than just as strike groups or amphibious ready groups. So we can transpose ships from around the world, whether they're underway or they're tied up in port, uh, into a battle scenario uh, and in their combat information centers, give them the sense and the feel that they really are in the fight, even if they're peer side. And this is all done, uh, much of it is done uh, uh, virtually. It allows us to take uh, uh, F-18 Super Hornets as an example and make them look like adversary fighters. Uh, it makes the EW signature of those aircraft look like an adversary uh, fighter uh, or bomber. Uh, and the weapons that come that come off of those aircraft, again, uh, they have the characteristics or we can simulate the characteristics of an adversary. So we can train much more effectively this way, particularly um, uh, with respect to our concept of distributed maritime operations, where fleet commanders uh, are responsible for uh, basically fighting as a fleet and not uh, as just with individual surface action groups or carrier strike groups, but in a much more distributed, connected, uh, connected manner. So LVC has been a game changer for us in terms of uh, allowing us to train very effectively as fleets. And I'll pause here for any follow-ups on, on that stuff. Good morning, Admiral. Uh, Commander Strauch from the German Navy. I have a question on the AUKUS deal. Um, so with the AUKUS deal, my understanding is that um, Australia will have nuclear-powered submarines in future, and the US Navy will help them. One idea is to first, as a first step for Australia, to kind of lease uh, older Virginia-class submarines and then uh, extend to another class of new submarines. Um, with you as the responsible officer in the U.S. Navy uh, being responsible for having enough submarines uh, for, for all combatant commands, and there are subject matter experts that argue that the U.S. Navy are not building enough of those Virginia-class submarines. How do you feel about giving away one of your 
or at least two, three submarines to the nation, whereas you're under pressure to, to come up with more submarines. Thank you. Well, certainly the, trans, the transferring of submarines is part of the agreement. However, it's condition-based. And so there are a uh, large number of steps that have to be in place. Uh, an ecosystem that has to be developed to support any submarines that might be transferred. So the decision to actually execute is years away. Um, and so that's why we have a phased approach uh, with respect to increased port visits of our attack, attack submarines uh, to ports in Australia as a first step. Uh, as a second step uh, to have four deployed submarines, uh, probably up to four out of an Australian port. Uh, these ships would be uh, would be co-crewed with Australians, uh, and that we'd be able to work together uh, to learn uh, how these submarines operate, how we sustain them. Uh, and then there has to be a, an ecosystem, of course, with respect to maintenance uh, and, and submarine production that has to be developed in Australia, as well as, I would say, uh, a culture uh, that is um, that supports the safe um, and responsible operation of nuclear powered vessels. So there's a number of steps that have to happen. And among those, of course, are the uh, sovereign interest of the United States on whether or not uh, we would decrement our own force uh, in numbers to transfer one uh, to the Australians or whether by the end of the decade, uh, the U.S. production lines have increased to the point uh, where it's easier for us, where we actually uh, might have, uh, if, if you, if for lack of better terms, excess capacity uh, to transfer a submarine or more to the Australians. So I think the bottom line there is that um, we're going to work together. Uh, we are being completely honest and transparent with each other as partners. And this would include the, uh, the Royal Navy as well uh, as an equal partner in this. Uh, the three of us have to agree to each step. And so it's a, it is a complex um, uh, agreement uh, and a complex, I think, path forward. I have a question about ships, which is, I believe, the core of the Navy. We've had problems. We've had problem with the uh, Ford carrier delayed about five years. The Zumwalt destroyer doesn't seem to be moving forward. And the LCS is being, uh, th those that are out there are being decommissioned. Uh, we're concerned about design and production of ships. And can you give us some background on these problems and what's being done about it? I think, um, I think key to the issues that you mentioned uh, is whether or not our Navy has learned from those problems. I would tell you that we have um, some examples of that uh, for the Columbia class submarine that we're building right now, that's actually uh, slightly ahead of schedule of its 84 month build rate uh, is the fact that that submarine was at the 83% design complete phase as we started bending steel. If I compared that to Seawolf was maybe a 25% Ohio class uh, the, the previous generation SSBN was at 4% design. So uh, that's one example of learning from mistakes we've made in the past. I would tell you another, uh, another example, which is tied to all three of those hulls that you mentioned, uh, is, is to do more land-based prototyping um, to ensure that new technologies that we introduce to our ships are proven before we actually uh, install them on our, on, on our ships. And so we are doing that with the propulsion plant for the frigates that we're building up in Wisconsin. Uh, we've done that for the Columbia class SSBN. We've done that for our DDG program, which has been very successful and will continue for DD, DDGX. As we design the new uh, class of destroyer, one of the things we learned previously was that we've had most success when Navy has been in the lead for the design with our Naval architects. Uh, leading the effort. However, it's a collaborative effort with, with private shipbuilders. And so for DDGX, we are working very closely uh, with Bath Ironworks, uh, as well as Huntington Ingalls, the two producers of our destroyers. So in short, sir, what we're trying to do 
uh, is learn from those mistakes we made in the past, not repeat them, to drive down technical risk so that we keep ships um, under cost uh, or at cost uh, and on schedule. Um, we are following that to a T right now. With, I mentioned Columbia, but also the new frigate class. Um, we're very optimistic about the new Flight 3 DDG and the transition from Flight 2 to Flight 3 with a new radar, with improved DW systems, with all the cooling and power systems that support them has gone very well. Uh, and so that, uh, that particular flight of DDG brings a whole new uh, generation of capability to us. So I am uh, very optimistic about the path that we're on right now with respect to shipbuilding. I say that uh, I am not overconfident. Uh, we are still learning every day. And of course, part of the uh, part of what we want to do here is to learn uh, and is to self-correct, to be honest with ourselves, so that we don't end up with uh, a new class of ship where we have significant problems like we've seen in the past. I hope that was uh, helpful. Sir, uh, Major John Cohen, U.S. Army. Uh, I'd like to ask you a, a question about the maritime implications from the war in Ukraine. The Ukrainian Navy has demonstrated a surprising capacity to achieve limited sea denial in the Black Sea against a stronger Russian Navy. Just would like to hear your thoughts on how they were able to do so and if there are any implications for the U.S. Navy uh, based on the example demonstrated by the Ukrainians. Thank you. Yeah, I think the Ukrainians have, have done a, uh, a marvelous job in terms of targeting. They've been very effective in putting ordnance on target in a way that has uh, changed the behavior of the Russian Navy at sea. I also think their use of mines uh, has also been quite effective. Uh, there's a cleanup there that uh, we're going to have to deal with, but it has been effective in terms of um, pushing uh, the Russian Navy back. Uh, when you take a look at uh, the numbers of Russian ships that are operating in the Black Sea now, it's at a much lower rate than we've seen in the past. There's a reason for that, that, uh, that you hint at uh, with respect to the, the effectiveness of, um, of the Ukrainians. I think there's a lot to learn there in terms of uh, how they've been able to uh, target so well, how they've been able to leverage um, commercial technologies and apply that to uh, targeting. Um, in ways that um, uh, is pretty fundamental to their success. And one of the reasons they've been able to do that is because um, their, their forces now comprise of citizen soldiers and citizen sailors, many of whom were in private industry, many of whom were in high tech industry, who bring a, who bring a, who bring a, a level of innovativeness uh, to their Navy that they didn't have before and to their Army that they didn't have before. And they're leveraging those technologies. They're building apps. They're using those technology, they're using that microprocessing capability off of their handheld devices uh, very effectively. So a lot to learn there in terms of being very agile and flexible um, and uh, being able to uh, take advantage of vulnerabilities very quickly uh, and staying one, one step ahead of their adversary in doing so. Good morning, Admiral. Mike McCrabb, uh, U.S. Navy, retired. Uh, this is not a question. It's more just a comment uh, and kind of a tip of the hat. I do not work for the Naval War College, but a tip of the hat to them uh, and their international programs that they run. Uh, there's about 100 international students that are about to graduate this week, and along with the 100 every year after the, before that, uh, they go out and establish a, a good solid foundation for interoperability with their services and our services. Um, and they're coming up with new courses on a regular basis. Uh, it's something I don't think a lot of folks in the Navy has a full appreciation for, but they are on the leading edge of, of, that, uh, of those PME uh, uh, initiatives. Postgraduate school has 200 international students going in there. And of course, we have, like you mentioned before, the International CNO Fellows uh, and another 7,000 other students, international students, going through various training in U.S. Navy courses uh, to help man the same uh, weapon systems that you mentioned earlier. So just wanted to kind of highlight those. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks for saying that. Um, uh, as I said up front, I do think as we talk about the theme of preserving America's leadership role, um, I think this is fundamental to that. Uh, there's been a big, in, there's been an increased investment in IMED programs, not only in the Navy, but across the Joint Force. And we've been challenged with the question, how many more students can you take? Uh, and then the next question is, where would they come from? Uh, those have not been hard questions to answer. And we've tried to do our level best in order to increase those opportunities for allies and partners. Because to your point, Mike, you made more eloquently than I did, uh, how important that is uh, to the future and the relationships that we have with those navies. Because at the end of the day, uh, the technology is one thing, but it's all grounded upon uh, relationships on a, bedrock, an, on a bedrock of trust. And so thanks for your points. Uh, good morning, uh, CNO. Thank you for uh, being with us today. Uh, Tom Roden here of Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, sir, I was wondering, you, you, I want to go back to the training piece that you were talking about, and specifically live virtual constructive. And, and, and we heard earlier today that, that our alliances are the secret sauce. And so mm -hmm. as, as we look forward into the future, you talked about live virtual constructive and from the joint perspective. Could you give us your thoughts on, an, and are we doing enough from the, from the, from the combined perspective as we look at, the, at what the coming conflict might be? Are we doing enough from the live virtual constructive perspective with, uh, with our allies and with our partners to be prepared for that fight? The big exercises we run, Northern Edge, RIMPAC, et cetera, they're great, but they're very expensive. And is there a way that we can do it much more cost effectively? Yeah, thanks, sir. I think uh, to your point, LVC is the right answer there. I will tell you, to, to answer your question, uh, are we comfortable with where we are? The answer to that is no. I would never say that we are sharing widely enough. Uh, and so we're doing a better job. I'm optimistic in the track that we're on. An example of that would be Project Overmatch, uh, uh, which is the Navy's contribution to JADC2 that's underway right now with the Vincent Strike Group off the coast of California. Um, so that technology, we are sharing with key allies and partners. And so we're already opening the door in JADC2. Um, on a handshake uh, with the French, um, uh, we initiated Navy 4th uh, and 5th Gen integrated training. That's an area that we have proceeded very slowly uh, uh, with F-35s. But if we're going to, I think to the, to the point that you were making, sir, the first time that we, uh, that we trained together in an integrated way at the, at, the very highest, uh, at the very highest level can't be when we're in combat. LVC gives us the ability to do those things um, at a level that's affordable and I think much more effective. And I think it opens the doors for other navies as well. Um, there's definitely possibilities that we need to take advantage of with LVC as we expand it. Uh, I think that the, uh, uh, I, I think we uh, are the biggest um, uh, constraint uh, to moving out faster with respect to sharing that technology technology with, with allies and partners. So um, probably an unsatisfactory answer for you, but I will tell you that we are looking for ways. I think the, the example with the French is probably among the best where there's been a, a hesitation to share F-35 technology with other countries. And uh, we got to the point where we said, look, we're going to have to fly with them. We're going to have to fight with them. We're going to have to find a way uh, to work around some of these constraints so that we can move forward. And we did that. Um, and so I think that uh, uh, we need to look for ways to open more doors. And we need, I would encourage those that are graduating this week uh, not to suffer in silence, but to be more vocal. Your CNOs certainly are uh, when, they, uh, when they call upon me to do more. So, sir, thanks for the question. And uh, I think that uh, we need to uh, continue to look for opportunities to share technology and to move forward together. Thanks. CNO, we want to thank you for your time today. I know that you join me in wishing our students who are headed out into the world the very best as they navigate a very complex environment with social media and hyper connectivity and prepare to practice the profession of arms and possibly have to operate in very austere communication environments. Sir, you've done a great job 
leading us here at the Naval War College in communicating to us about your priorities. Sir, our entire community thanks you for your leadership and thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Admiral. I appreciate your time today. I know it was too short, but uh, as always, the questions were, were very good and gave me something to take back and think about as well. So thanks. I wish you all a great conference for the rest of the week and, uh, of course, a, a spectacular graduation on Friday. Thank you.